Good evening. My name is Jean-Daniel Loparco, and I am the president of the IMD Alumni Club of Lausanne. On behalf of the IMD Alumni Club of Lausanne, I'm honored to welcome you all here at IMD in Lausanne and everyone worldwide to this event led by esteemed speaker, Dr. Thomas Bach, president of the International Olympic Committee. I say worldwide because this is our first global IMD Alumni Club streaming event. This event will be facilitated by Professor Susan Goldworthy, who will introduce our renowned guest speaker tonight, D Dr. Bach. Professor Goldworthy is affiliate professor of leadership and organizational change at IMD. She is co-author of award-winning books such as Care to Dare, Choosing Change, and her most recent one, Where the Wild Things Were. But above all, and that's, I'm so happy to have Susan to, uh, with us tonight. She's an Olympic finalist in swimming in Montreal 1976, an important year, and stay tuned. But before I hand over to Susan, may I share with you a few words regarding our IMD Alumni Club of Lausanne MBA scholarship program. Two years ago, the Club of Lausanne established an annual MBA scholarship of 50,000 francs to support IMD in its pursuit to attract the best MBA candidates. As you may know, business schools compete vigorously to attract the best talents and the MBA ranking not only depends on the quality of teaching, but as well on the level of participant. The IMD Alumni Club of Lausanne established this initiative to, with the aim of protecting the IMD brand, our brand. I will conclude by sharing with you a short video presented by Sean Mian, Dean of MBA Program and Shweta Mukesh, the first beneficiary of the IMD Alumni Club of Lausanne MBA Scholarship. As you know, our program is known for the quality of its students, of its great participants over many, many years. To secure that quality in today's marketplace, we need to offer generous grants just like our competition. And we've been able to do so with the help of our alumni body around the world. When I was growing up, my parents really struggled to make ends meet. And as a result of that, they put their passions and ambitions on the back burner and joined the corporate world. However, it was really only in their mid-50s that they felt financially secure and in a place to pursue their own passions. I wanted to create a model for my life where I could do well while doing good. And that's exactly what the Merit Scholarship gives me. I'm honored at this privilege and I will do my very best to use my platform to create a multiplier effect for change. We thank you so much for your support and we encourage you to continue. Thank you, IMD alumni. Thank you, IMD alumni. Wonderful to see real learning and real impact in action with that video. Um, so what future for the Olympic Games? It gives me great pleasure to be here tonight to um, introduce Dr. Thomas back. And after we've spoken with Thomas, then we'll be introducing uh, Pierre Ducre, who will also be talk um, Associate Director of the Olympics, uh, who will be talking to us about, we're going to be looking at the Olympic Agenda 2020, the Reform Agenda and talking about the challenges uh, and progress that has been made. Um, in 2013, Thomas was elected president of the IOC, and he very quickly introduced a major change initiative, the Olympic Agenda 2020. Fourteen working groups were been put in place in 2014, and they came up with 40 recommendations which came out of 40,000 submissions from the public and which created 1,200 ideas. From all of this input and these 40 recommendations, the IOC was able to get a clear vision for the future and to look at how could they protect the uniqueness of the games and to look at how to strengthen the values of the games in society. So with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Thomas Back, if you could come and join me on stage. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
But, but please, uh, no doctor, I'm not in the pills business. <laughs> so I was delighted to discover that we were both um, at the Olympic Games in Montreal. We didn't meet there. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> we may have passed. Yeah, exactly. Um, and when I think back to those games, I have some memories of uh, three things came to mind. One was, I don't know if you remember, at the closing ceremony, they gave us glow sticks to break. And it was the first time I'd ever seen them. And all the athletes in the closing ceremony had these glow sticks we were waving, which was quite a unique sight to see. Um, I also remember the soundproof music room where you could go and listen and relax to music and listening to Bridge Over Troubled Water by Simon and Garfunkel. And then another memory was seeing Olga Corbett in the athlete's canteen, because previously I'd only ever seen her on television, and here she was live at the, uh, at the event. What are some of your memories of the 76 Games? Bridge over troubled water reminds me of other things than Olympic Games, <laughs> but uh, it's nevertheless great memories. Uh, with, the, with the closing ceremony, I must admit uh, that uh, uh, we did not go there uh, then, uh, because uh, uh, the uh, the games in uh, in Montreal were the first uh, games after Munich and the terrorist attack of Munich, and uh, they happened at the time when uh, in in Germany uh, we had uh, uh, the the Red Army, uh, so terrorist uh, uh, groups, and uh, there then uh, our security uh, people uh, told us that after. Uh, having won the gold medal, uh, we would be too exposed uh, to uh, any kind of uh, uh, terrorist uh, threats uh, there, and uh, we better should stay in the Olympic Village uh, for uh, the closing uh, ceremony. So I watched you on TV uh, breaking <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, the yeah. sticks. Yes, and could, uh, and my, uh, my Olga Korbut uh, is... Uh, what was his name? Uh, uh, Leonid Vasiliev, or what? Uh, the, the, ah. the heavyweight. Uh, uh, Vasiliev, yes. Weight, weight, Vasiliev Alexeyev, a guy uh, one meter ninety, uh, uh, and uh, him I was you know, and walking, uh, could hardly walk, and uh, there I was pumping into him one day in the cafeteria. Uh, this was my Olga Korbut uh, moment, uh, which, I, <laughs> uh, which, I, which I had later, because uh, Olga is, uh, until today, she's very much involved in gymnastics uh, as, a, as a referee and, uh, and official. So I, uh, I got to know her then a little bit later. Fantastic. No, wonderful. And we have actually a, a memory for you of, uh, of 76. If we, uh, here we go. <laughs> you could, uh, yes, so we well, can what, see what do you laugh about? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <You're>, uh, so, <laughs> yeah. so I was fortunate to make the finals, but not fortunate enough to win the gold medal as you did, which is rather wonderful. So many congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so when you took over as president in 2013, you introduced this major change initiative, Olympic Agenda 2020 reform. Um, with three overarching topics of credibility, sustainability, and youth. What was it that drove you to immediately introduce a change initiative? Why, why was it necessary? And why those three topics? I think uh, you, you could see uh, the wave coming uh, there uh, to, uh, to the Olympics. And in, in fact, uh, the, the, the plan of Olympic agenda and uh, the sustainability, credibility, and uh, these issues were part of my campaign there for election uh, there at the time because you 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 could see uh, you could see the way for uh, the tsunami coming mm. uh, it was uh, for everybody who wanted uh, to to see uh, it was clear that uh, we have a challenge uh, with regard uh, to uh, the organization of uh, the games uh, with the cost of the organization uh, with uh, uh, the, the the legacy, the the the, the games in in, uh, in a number of countries, you know, had become just a matter of uh, prestige, uh, uh, which uh, was not uh, according uh, to, to 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 the times anymore. Uh, you. Uh, uh, 
could clearly see that we would have uh, problems uh, uh, with uh, the uh, uh, with uh, the finding candidates that we would have uh, problems with uh, justifying uh, the organization of uh, the games in, uh, in, in, in this way. Uh, you could see that uh, there were uh, problems in, in the credibility uh, for sport and in both areas uh, with regard to uh, the running of uh, uh, the, the sport uh, organizations, uh, which was not up anymore to the standards of uh, uh, good governance, as well as uh, with uh, regard uh, to the sports uh, uh, competitions, where uh, uh, the uh, I think uh, you know the the focus, uh, uh, at least from my point of view, was. Uh, was a, was a wrong one, you know. We uh, there we were always uh, talking about uh, fight against doping. Mm. This is correct. Uh, this is uh, very important, but it's not uh, the ultimate goal. What we have to fight for is uh, for the clean athletes. Right. Right. And uh, we we have uh, to set our, our our mind in a way uh, to to think about what we can do for the clean athletes, mm. and there to fight against doping is only one part okay. of yes. uh, what uh, we have uh, to do, and uh, both has to come together because if uh, the sport organization does not have uh, a credibility anymore, then uh, one day, sooner or later, also uh, the, the, the competitions organized by this organization will, will suffer. Mm. And the other way around. Mm. If you have a sport uh, where uh, the competitions are not credible anymore, then uh, also the organization uh, will be affected and will lose uh, credibility. Mm. And uh, this uh, was also, you know, pretty clear. Right. Uh, uh, then uh, the third point was uh, that uh, we could uh, see with the uh, youth uh, that, uh, mm. Mm. that we have uh, <laughs> new challenges. Uh, it was uh, not anymore uh, like in my generation, I will not say in our, because you're much younger, even <laughs> oh, if you have participated kind. in the same <laughs> games. But uh, that at a, at a certain moment in your life, you were uh, confronted with sport. Mm. Yeah. Uh, whether it was in, in school, uh, with your friends, uh, with parents, you, 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 you name it. But at some stage, sport was there. And this is not uh, true anymore for, for the youth uh, of uh, uh, today. Mm. Uh, so uh, we had to look for ways uh, how we can reconnect okay. uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the youth. And uh, this uh, we, we saw at, uh, at the time as the three major uh, challenges uh, we, would, uh, we would face. Uh, Sustainability, mm. Mm. credibility, and uh, and uh, and youth, and uh, I think we we were not that wrong right. with these uh, three topics, uh, but uh, where uh, at least I was wrong uh, was uh, with the speed mm. the tsunami would come. You know, I thought we could approve uh, this uh, Olympic agenda in 2014. Uh, then uh, I would have uh, the, the first uh, three, four years of my presidency uh, to prepare uh, uh, everything. And uh, then when the wave uh, would come, we would be fine. <laughs> that was a mistake. Uh, the wave came much quicker okay. yep. and, uh, and much harder. Mm. Uh, but uh, so uh, we had to, to, to work also much harder and uh, we had to, to accelerate right. uh, many of our, of our measures uh, being, uh, being taken uh, 
uh, to come out of this, and uh, this is what uh, we have tried to do. And because it says 2020, but I, I imagine these are still relevant beyond 2020. Yeah, you know, uh, such kind of reforms uh, never end. Mm. Uh, mm. You, you cannot, in, in, in our world, you cannot say, now I have done a reform program in the next five <laughs> years. Uh, uh, we have already reformed the reforms. In, in, in the meantime, and uh, this, uh, this uh, will, will uh, continue. You know, the, to give you one example, uh, we have reformed uh, the candidature procedure for, for the games at the very beginning, in, in a revolution. After four years, uh, we have realized uh, it, it's not enough. Uh, so uh, last year, then again, we have reformed uh, the, their reform mm. uh, with regard to uh, to, to youth uh, they're one of the major measures we undertook uh, was uh, the the Olympic channel mm. uh, which then we started in 2016 <laughs> worked very very successfully uh, but now we, we see already that uh, the Olympic channel is not enough mm -hmm. again uh, so uh, the olympic channel has to be integrated into a more holistic uh, digital uh, right. strategy so next step and the, the same is true uh, uh, for, uh, for for many more of the recommendations uh, uh, where we are there for instance is uh, where we can say, okay, that that's done, is uh, gender equality mm. uh, with regard to participation in, 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 in the games. This we have achieved in these uh, five uh, years. Uh, we have made some major steps forward with regard to, to governance. Mm. But there again, the standards uh, are evolving and uh, that we have to keep adapting. So our motto for the uh, agenda was and uh, still is, change or be changed. Right, okay. Yes. And this we will continue, and what we will have to discuss, uh, and what we will do now after the, the, the Olympic Games Tokyo 2020, is whether we need a new Olympic agenda, or whether we feel comfortable that uh, with the topics of uh, sustainability, credibility, and youth, uh, we have identified the major challenges also for uh, the years to come. And uh, we can uh, then address the challenges uh, which will come more with a kind of strategic roadmap rather than to make another revolution after, after six years. Right. OK, no, thank you. I know we have people who want to ask questions from the audience. And so I want to throw it open two questions. So it was a very nice evening. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> and if they enjoy, don't, I have enjoy your drinks. Uh, Jane, it's wonderful. Uh, oh, yes, we, we can throw the. Yes, so. Uh, good evening, and thank you, uh, Ian Thomas Bach, for being here. Um, Ian Stewart, um, uh, you said in your opening remarks that uh, it's sad that today not everybody is confronted by sport. Um, when I was a kid, everybody played sports somewhere, either outside of school, inside of school, with parents, whatever, as you said. And that's not true anymore. Um, one of my current roles is that I'm on the board of, I'm a trustee of the International Institute for Sustainability, for st Sustainable Development, excuse me. Um, and we had a board meeting in Canada and Toronto two weeks ago. And there was a discussion among some of the young academics, none of whom had played sports, attacking the Olympics on the expected grounds. One, the level of travel involved in preparation and also in the games itself. And then two, in the construction of buildings and, and uh, stadiums, which maybe didn't get used as much as we would have liked afterwards. And I responded in two ways. I'm, gonna, I'm making a comment, then I'm going to ask a question. Forgive me, I'm indulging. Um, my comment was one. Uh, Whilst we may live in a world where we're attempting to find 
neutrality on carbon emissions in general, there are some things in life where it's worth investing the carbon. And I consider that the um, exchange that takes place between nations at youth level for the Olympics is one of those things. And the second thing I said was that there's new management, they're doing the best they can, let's find out what they do later. So I wanted to make that comment so I didn't make it as a question to you because I, I understand what's going on and I, I, I as someone who um, was almost at the Olympics uh, and, and, was, and is a fan, um, still think it's worth doing. The question therefore is, going forward, if you're going to attack um, the concerns about credibility and I know the work that's being done on sustainability and engaging youth is everything for the Olympics, and if we assume you'll deal with those things, what do you worry about? I'd like to know what Thomas Park worries about from day to day. Uh, it's not about, you know, uh, if you're, uh, we're here in a management school, uh, managing is, is not about worrying. Uh, managing is about uh, finding solutions. And uh, there, uh, you know, we have, I think we have pretty much addressed uh, the sustainability with uh, regard to, to cost and in parts also with regard to, to carbon emission when it comes to, to the construction side. Uh, there, uh, you know, we have uh, allocated uh, the, the games uh, to, to Paris 24 and to Los Angeles 28, and both of them have uh, already 90%. Uh, more than 90% of all the facilities ready. For LA, it will even be 100% uh, because uh, uh, they will use uh, uh, UCLA as uh, the Olympic uh, village, uh, so they do not even need to build a new housing. Mm -hmm. What is very much welcome in Paris, huh? as a general investment, because they need a new housing, but if you restrict your fuel just to, to carbon uh, uh, emission and, and, uh, and costs, uh, then uh, uh, they need to, to build uh, this, uh, this uh, village. So uh, now the focus is shifting there uh, uh, a little bit more on uh, uh, the, the challenges of uh, climate change uh, and carbon emission. And there we have to make a difference between summer and, uh, and winter games, for instance. But what we can say uh, so far and what we have achieved uh, so far is uh, the, the IOC uh, itself is a carbon neutral uh, organization. And, uh, as you may know, our new Olympic House is uh, one of the most sustainable buildings in, 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 in the world. And uh, it is, uh, in its category, as an office building, the most sustainable building in, uh, in, in, in the world, uh, according there to, to the international uh, certification. Uh, when it comes uh, to uh, the Olympic Games, uh, then uh, let's start with uh, summer. Uh, there we, uh, we have uh, the situation that uh, Tokyo uh, will be uh, carbon neutral, but, but uh, we will, on the one hand, still have the lowest carbon uh, emission. It will be about uh, 3 uh, million tons. This will be less than any games uh, before, so we still have to compensate these uh, three million. They will be compensated. And for the first time, again, uh, there these, uh, uh, the compensation uh, will be for everything in the games. It will not only be related to the organizing committee, but it will be for the overall uh, organization of uh, uh, the games. There we have to see that uh, Tokyo has been elected before uh, we approved the Olympic agenda. So uh, not all the measures uh, could uh, uh, be applied to Tokyo. Paris will be the first 
full Olympic Agenda 2020 Games. There, for Paris, we will cut these uh, 3 million in half to 1.5 uh, million. And uh, the rest, uh, again, uh, will, be, uh, will be compensated. Mm. And uh, then uh, we are uh, looking and now uh, already for Los Angeles. And uh, of course, uh, we would be very happy, but there I cannot uh, promise anything yet or may make a commitment. Uh, but uh, uh, we are looking it in, in a way uh, then uh, to make uh, LA uh, carbon positive, uh, uh, even. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the, the the plan uh, for uh, for uh, the uh, uh, for 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 the summer uh, games and is part of our sustainability uh, uh, efforts. Uh, winter games is more difficult. Uh, in, in different respects. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, because of uh, climate change, uh, we will lose uh, here in Europe, I guess, more than 50% of uh, potential destinations uh, for uh, Winter Olympic uh, Games. And uh, even in the rest, uh, we will uh, have, again, there in Europe, but not only in Europe, but mainly in Europe, we will uh, face uh, more uh, challenges uh, with uh, regard to, to snow making. Mm -hmm. uh, even, you know, in the destinations uh, which are higher up, uh, uh, you have uh, to, to produce uh, artificial uh, snow. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, it will be very much about uh, using uh, new uh, technologies uh, like uh, China is doing now for uh, the games in 22, but there is uh, still room for improvement. And uh, there, if you look at uh, the, the, the figures uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to give you an idea, uh, uh, there in uh, 2007, uh, all over Europe, uh, there were uh, 300 snowmaking uh, uh, machines. Guess how many there are now, 12 years later, in Switzerland only? 3,000. And that uh, gives you an idea of, uh, of the challenge uh, for uh, the, the, the Olympic Games are only, you know, uh, mm. uh, such a small part of the, the challenge. Uh, this is uh, for winter sport industry uh, all across uh, Europe, uh, for all these uh, destinations, for winter sport in, 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 in general. Uh, um, uh, so this is one part of uh, the challenge uh, there that we have, and uh, this is why it's not by coincidence uh, that uh, we have now uh, the Winter Games, or we had now the Winter Games in, uh, in Korea, mm -hmm. Asia, that uh, we have the next ones uh, in uh, Beijing, mm -hmm. Asia, and uh, then uh, we have Europe, Milan, Cortina, but uh, that for uh, 2030, uh, uh, there uh, the, we have uh, already a number of uh, interested uh, uh, cities. Yes, there is also in Europe, but it's mainly again coming from Asia and, uh, and America. Um, and uh, there, uh, then in, in this framework, we, we still will have to do the same, try to do the same uh, uh, for the winter games, uh, what we do for the summer games, uh, to uh, uh, reduce uh, the, the carbon uh, footprint uh, as much as uh, possible, and if ever possible, then 
to turn it uh, into positive as, as soon as, uh, as uh, possible. Mm. Yeah. Uh, thank you for defending us uh, there in, uh, <laughs> in the Institute. Thank you, Ian. James. I have a question about youth. Um, so we had some uh, Swiss Olympic um, uh, people here a few years ago, and they were saying that um, it's a great distraction from their studies. So the question is, you know, how do you prepare Olympic athletes for afterwards? Not all of them go on to be IMD professors. <laughs> and it, it seems to me that you're taking the brightest and the best at the age of 10 they're focusing 15 years of their life on something. And then what? What happens if society placed that energy towards, I don't know, learning medicine, learning coding? Um, so how do you answer life after uh, being an Olympic? And is this good for society? Well, it starts earlier uh, because uh, really this uh, perception that uh, sport is a distraction from education is wrong. It's totally wrong. Uh, sport, as already the old Romans knew, and what we know now from, from recent uh, studies, so that they were right in saying mens sana in corpore sano, uh, because uh, physical activity uh, greatly uh, supports uh, education uh, in, in two ways. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, sport is an excellent uh, value education uh, where you learn best, uh, maybe, social uh, skills, uh, where you know about uh, values, uh, where you get to know about uh, respecting rules, uh, where you know to work, to get to know, uh, to work in a, in a team uh, where uh, you get to know, to respect uh, uh, each other, uh, uh, even if you're in competition uh, with uh, uh, somebody, where, where you learn a whole set of uh, social uh, skills, uh, like you, you cannot do it. If uh, you uh, sit uh, these uh, people there uh, behind the bench and say, now I teach you uh, social skills in sports, you have to live it. And you learn it by doing. And uh, you learn it sometimes without knowing. Mm. Second is uh, that uh, the studies uh, there also show that uh, kids uh, who are playing sports, they can concentrate better and they can concentrate uh, longer because uh, by doing sport, it's very easy. They get more oxygen to the brain than uh, if you just uh, sit uh, with a mouse uh, uh, all day, uh, all day uh, through. So uh, sport is not a distraction from education. Uh, sport uh, serves and supports uh, uh, education. This is number one. The second part of uh, your question uh, is about uh, supporting uh, their uh, elite athletes and to prepare them for the life uh, uh, after uh, sport. Uh, there we are starting already uh, uh, during uh, their uh, career and uh, this is another part of our uh, Olympic Agenda 2020 programs where we say uh, athletes uh, are at uh, the heart of uh, the Olympic uh, movement and it's part of how we protect the clean athletes. Uh, there is, uh, first of all, uh, that uh, we are uh, uh, offering uh, scholarships uh, so-called Olympic uh, scholarships uh, uh, for athletes uh, across uh, the world, which allows them uh, to uh, prepare uh, for the Games, to take part in the qualification, but at the same time to follow studies or uh, also to, to uh, continue uh, their, their professional uh, life. Uh, there we have uh, 
now only for Tokyo, around uh, 2,000 athletes. I think it's close to 2,000 athletes around the world who are benefiting uh, from these uh, kind of uh, uh, scholarships. Then uh, we have uh, a program on online learning on uh, our uh, Athletes Hub. It's uh, the Athletes uh, 365 uh, Hub. Uh, where uh, they uh, uh, can uh, benefit from these online learning uh, programs. Thirdly, uh, we have a pilot, uh, uh, no, maybe third, uh, then we have a, a program uh, together with uh, ADECO, uh, of which uh, close to 90,000 athletes uh, already benefited, uh, where uh, uh, they uh, can uh, enjoy training, uh, but uh, where ADECO is also uh, helping uh, them uh, to get uh, access uh, to uh, the, the labor market, uh, to find uh, uh, em 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 employers uh, uh, for them, and then where they can either start uh, their career or uh, continue uh, their uh, career. And uh, then, uh, finally, we have a pilot uh, a project uh, with uh, the Peace Nobel Prize uh, winner, Professor Yunus, uh, 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 with whom uh, we, we started uh, this uh, project uh, there last year, uh, where there is, again, is a, an online learning uh, course uh, for athletes uh, who are considering to become entrepreneurs. Uh, so uh, the, they started with this uh, online uh, training program. Uh, then they have uh, to pass uh, some examination after some time. Uh, then uh, they have to pass more examination. Uh, the ones uh, who are excluded, uh, they still get access uh, then to the ADECO uh, program. And uh, then uh, finally, uh, we will have a small uh, group of uh, these uh, athletes identified uh, by, uh, uh, by, by Mohamed Yunus and his, uh, and his team. And uh, then uh, we will uh, finance uh, them uh, a startup so uh, that uh, they can uh, then uh, start their career as, uh, as entrepreneurs. So the ISC does see a responsibility to support athletes post their careers? Yes, uh, of course we, we see uh, this uh, responsibility. It, it, in the end, it lies uh, mainly with the National Olympic uh, <coughs> Committees. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, what, uh, we are, what we are offering uh, is uh, uh, there uh, our, our programs, uh, our, our uh, know-how. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, we are also dedicating, uh, you know, a big portion of our resources. Uh, two, uh, two programs uh, which are directly uh, supporting athletes. Mm. Uh, to, gi to give you an idea, maybe uh, the overall uh, uh, picture, uh, the IOC is uh, in investing 90%, uh, 90% of all our revenues into uh, the development of sport and for the support of, uh, of athletes. This means uh, in, in, the, in the four years of this Olympiad, uh, this means uh, 5 billion US dollars going to uh, the support of sport uh, and the athletes uh, worldwide. Mm. Part of these are these Olympic uh, scholarships, uh, part of these are, are, are the other programs. But in, in, in general, the, the athletes are uh, supported like uh, you're supporting athletes uh, in, a, in football or in, in basketball, uh, uh, the money goes to the teams. And the athletes, you know, in the Olympic Games, they are participating not as individual athletes, uh, they are participating 
as uh, the Olympic uh, uh, team of uh, Switzerland, of uh, United States, of uh, Ivory Coast, uh, you, you, you name it. So we distribute uh, this money to the participating uh, teams and then they redistribute it uh, then uh, uh, to uh, the athletes and the sport in, in their country because uh, they know best what the athletes need and what, uh, what sports uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the country uh, uh, needs. And the same goes uh, for the uh, participating international federations who only, also benefit uh, there uh, from uh, this uh, distribu uh, distribution of uh, uh, money so that they then can organize in the time between the games uh, their, their competitions, which, which most of them could not do. Okay, yes, football could do, uh, uh, the tennis could do. Uh, but also with, uh, already with athletics, uh, it would become uh, difficult and uh, then they can organize the competitions for the athletes in the time in between. They can pay prize money to uh, uh, the athletes. Uh, they can uh, uh, provide uh, the referees. Uh, they can do the anti-doping uh, programs uh, and uh, so on what would not be possible uh, without this redistribution of, uh, of uh, the money uh, to the NOCs and IFs. And the third big part is uh, to the organizers uh, of uh, the Olympic Games uh, to make it happen for the athletes. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, to give you an example, uh, there for Tokyo, uh, but uh, 1.5 uh, billion uh, uh, US dollars, uh, which we will uh, contribute uh, to the successful organization of, uh, of uh, the Tokyo Games. So you mentioned the Tokyo Games, and just as we came on stage, it was announced the first case of coronavirus has been uh, announced in Switzerland, in Geneva. Um, and I Sure, you're asked this a lot at the moment. Uh, it's a very hot topic. You don't have a crystal ball. What is your view with respect to the coronavirus and the impact it may have on the Tokyo Olympic Games? Well, first of all, uh, we, we are taking uh, this uh, very seriously and you, you can uh, see uh, a great solidarity there in, uh, in the Olympic uh, movement. Mm to address uh, this uh, challenge uh, because uh, this is not uh, so much about Tokyo, it's about now. It's about uh, the, the, the qualification uh, there uh, for, for Tokyo and uh, there we have uh, a number of uh, challenges and, uh, and again a great solidarity uh, uh, there in, in the Olympic uh, uh, movement to, uh, to make it maybe a little bit more tangible. Uh, you know, we have many of uh, these Olympic uh, qualification competitions were supposed to be organized in China. Uh, so uh, uh, within weeks uh, uh, there these uh, big qualification competitions uh, had to be organized in, uh, in different countries. Uh, they, in cooperation with the Chinese, who were extremely effective and extremely helpful uh, there, uh, these events have to be, had to be moved uh, to other countries. But uh, the other countries, uh, then again, had to make it possible uh, that uh, Chinese athletes uh, can participate and are allowed uh, into, into uh, the country. Uh, uh, then uh, you had to see on, uh, on, on the other hand, uh, um, uh, what does it mean for, for the Chinese uh, athletes? Uh, so we were working and are working there with uh, international federations and with the Chinese Olympic uh, Committee to get as much as possible 
of the Chinese, as many as possible, of the Chinese athletes outside the country so that uh, they uh, are staying there, mm. that they are training there and that they are uh, from there uh, then traveling uh, to uh, the different uh, qualification uh, competitions. So uh, you have uh, now, for instance, you have the entire Chinese uh, wrestling team in, 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 in Serbia. You have the table tennis uh, team uh, in uh, in um, in Qatar. You have other teams in Croatia, uh, and uh, you have other teams in in, in France. Uh, mm. So there is a, a really a great uh, solidarity, also among uh, the national Olympic committees. Uh, receiving uh, the athletes, uh, organizing uh, these uh, events on, 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 very, on, on very short, uh, mm. on very short uh, uh, notice. And uh, uh, then uh, we are managing this uh, with, a, with a task uh, force. Uh, we have uh, internally already for, uh, I think, uh, Marc Pierre for, for more than a month. Um, where we are working there with the Chinese authorities, where we are working with the Japanese authorities, where we are working with all these uh, NOC's uh, concerns, and most importantly, where we are working uh, with the World uh, Health uh, uh, Organization. And there, I think, you know, we are, with all these measures, we are going even beyond uh, the uh, restrictions uh, uh, recommended by the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization has not issued travel restrictions mm -hmm. uh, so far, but uh, we, we are uh, applying uh, uh, many of them. And uh, uh, with all this, uh, I think uh, we are doing uh, what we, we can uh, now to uh, uh, get uh, through this uh, qualification uh, uh, procedure and uh, uh, there when we put all this in, into uh, the, the, the perspective uh, and uh, if we are taking the, the experts' uh, advice uh, uh, there uh, seriously, uh, then uh, I think we can all together really look forward uh, to uh, successful uh, Olympic Games in uh, Tokyo uh, at uh, the end of, uh, of uh, July. Thank you. Other questions, please? Yes, here. Lovely. Um, yes, uh, Derek just talked about Thank you so much for this talk. Um, first question, looking forward, if you look at 30 years forward, what would be the biggest opportunity for the RUC? And on a personal level, um, in your career or life, what were the three most intense experience or images actually that you had linked to the Olympic Games? Thank you. So 30 years forward, what would you like? And then also what have been the three most intense periods of your own life? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 30, uh, 30 years uh, forward, uh, I think uh, whoever tells you in, in these uh, times that he can look uh, 30 <laughs> years in the, into the future uh, uh, is uh, uh, a little bit a pretender. Uh, uh, I, what you can, I think, identify is, uh, is, is not uh, the, the real situation in 30 years uh, from now, but uh, uh, what you can identify and, uh, and then starting to try to preempt or, or address are, are some of, uh, some of the, the so-called mega trends. Uh, by which uh, sport is, is also uh, uh, affected. Uh, one uh, of these by, by which uh, we are uh, affected uh, is, uh, is uh, urbanization. Mm. Uh, what does it mean uh, uh, for, uh, for, for sport? Uh, many things. 
But uh, first of all is uh, that uh, this trend to, to urban life also applies uh, to uh, sporting activities. That means uh, that uh, we think uh, the time is gone uh, where you can build uh, some very nice uh, sporting uh, facilities uh, outside uh, the city and uh, then uh, present this as a, a great offer uh, for uh, the population of a metropolis. Uh, uh, for us, it's uh, the, the other way around. Uh, we think uh, you have to offer uh, sports uh, facilities uh, where the people are, mm. Mm. and not where you would like them to be. <laughs> and uh, this, uh, then again, has uh, has, has different uh, consequences. He, this is true for sports activity, but uh, this is also true uh, for a virtual world. Uh, uh, in order to, again, to confront them with uh, sport, uh, uh, you have uh, to be on the platforms where this young generation uh, is. Uh, and uh, you cannot uh, try to communicate uh, with them uh, through newspapers. So, uh, uh, this uh, time is over. It has also a consequence uh, for uh, uh, the, the genre of sports. So uh, there, this is why we, we think uh, that the sports who can easily be played uh, there uh, also in, in, in the urban living areas uh, that uh, uh, they uh, will have uh, a growing uh, popularity and, uh, and importance or formats of existing sports. Uh, there, let's say uh, uh, basketball and, and three on three as a new format of, of basketball mm -hmm. uh, where uh, the three and three Three on three uh, will be uh, much more important uh, in, in, in the future. This is why we took it on the Olympic program already now. Or sports uh, which we are taking on board now in, uh, in, 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 in Tokyo because of this uh, urbanization. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, climbing, uh, skateboarding, uh, for instance. Uh, where you can uh, organize uh, this sport and confront the people who would not necessarily be confronted with sport then by having your events in this in this urban in this urban uh, centers the other uh, mega trend of course uh, will be digitalization uh, there uh, we come uh, to uh, uh, the question of uh, the e-games the e uh, or, or e-sports, uh, where we think uh, the international federations, uh, sports federations, if uh, they want uh, to uh, maintain their relevance, uh, that uh, they uh, must look uh, into uh, uh, e-versions uh, of uh, their, their sport. Um, uh, and uh, uh, they uh, prepare themselves uh, there. Their uh, you know, augmented uh, reality will help uh, very much uh, because uh, there, uh, the more augmented reality you have, uh, the more physical activity uh, you can uh, have uh, also in, a, in an e-version of a, of, a, of a sport. But uh, already there, I cannot tell you how this will look like in not even in 10, 15 uh, years, because uh, there you, uh, you see somehow conflicting trends between the urbanization and digitalization. 
because uh, digitalization is, is very much about uh, individualization while uh, urbanization is uh, more about uh, community. So I, I, I do not know uh, how this trend of individualization and, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, in order to, to, to play sport or even to, to have a competition, you would not need to leave, uh, to leave your living room anymore. Uh, whether this will be the sport of the future or whether people after five or ten years uh, will say, hey, listen, uh, how boring. I'm sitting here alone and I'm, I'm running my bike and I have uh, there the, the, the screen and uh, the screen is pretending that I'm uh, here in the French Alps and uh, climbing <laughs> Alpe d'Huez. Uh, this is nonsense. Uh, it's much better. I'm uh, going out. I'm. Uh, I'm with my, my, my friends, uh, we are competing against uh, e each other, uh, we are motivating each other, we are having fun uh, together, forget about uh, all this, uh, uh, these uh, e-games, e-sport, I don't know. Mm. Uh, the only thing I, I know is uh, uh, that uh, the sports movement is, is uh, better being prepared uh, for uh, uh, for, for both, uh, and uh, then I have only one, uh, you know, one uh, one hope uh, is uh, that uh, by doing all this, uh, also in, uh, in in thirty years uh, from now. Uh, that uh, uh, sport is uh, is still about uh, values and is not a mere entertainment business. Mm. Mm. Uh, uh, yes, uh, sport must be entertaining, but it must not be mere entertainment. Uh, uh, and. Uh, there, uh, this uh, I think will be uh, one of the major of the major challenges. That uh, uh, there it is uh, when ad addressing or preempting uh, these uh, trends or trying to be proactive. Uh, that uh, we are not doing it for the sake of following a trend, mm. uh, but uh, that uh, the ultimate goal is uh, always uh, uh, to have in mind uh, how we can use this uh, trend to, uh, to better promote uh, our, our values. Mm. So coming to the second part, your, your three personal biggest challenges. In your life, that was in, you were in my life. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Um, a little bit more personal about actually the you three most intense. You don't want me to talk about my marriage or. Uh... <laughs> no, 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 no. That's why. That's why I mentioned a link to the IOC with the three most intense experiences you've had. Thank you. You know the fascinating thing. Uh, about uh, the, the IOC and, uh, and this uh, position in, 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 the, in the IOC is uh, uh, that uh, uh, every day uh, you have uh, uh, such a, a diversity of experiences and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, potential that it, it is uh, that uh, even uh, in our uh, and now I have to, to talk about my marriage anyway. Uh, the, <laughs> you know, when, when, when I come, come home uh, in the evening and my, my wife asks me, oh, and what uh, was going on today? I, I cannot tell her uh, because it's so much mm. and it's so rich. And uh, you, you always think uh, at the very moment, oh, this is quite something. And a couple of hours later, it's uh, already just uh, one 
uh, thing uh, uh, about uh, 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 among many uh, many others. If uh, uh, you ask me about uh, the major challenges for for the future uh, of uh, the IOC, then I can maybe give you a more uh, uh, in, in enlightening uh, uh, answer um, because again for, for the past uh, sometimes you overestimate you know if you would have asked me uh, this question uh, let's say uh, after my election then I would have said uh, to get Olympic Agenda 2020 passed uh, afterwards it was unanimously passed and then uh, you, you, you realized uh, that uh, there you uh, overestimated uh, their uh, uh, challenge. Uh, so I, I prefer to speak about uh, the, the future challenges uh, for, for the IOC. There, I think uh, uh, we have uh, uh, one. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, to keep connected uh, with the uh, with the youth, uh, uh, but uh, this is in in these fast changing times uh, a everyday challenge. The second one is uh, what we were just uh, uh, discussing uh, to uh, maintain uh, the the values orientation and to to, to uh, uh, you know to. Uh, make sure uh, that uh, uh, we, we do not only preserve uh, the values, that we try to strengthen uh, the values and uh, that uh, uh, it, it money is not becoming an end in itself but remains uh, just to be a tool uh, to, uh, to promote uh, the, the values and uh, there this is uh, um, uh, not easy and uh, will become maybe even more difficult uh, uh, because uh, uh, this is the, the other side of uh, the, the coin of success. Uh, uh, when you're uh, they are so successful then uh, many people uh, want to have uh, a piece of the cake and uh, most of them are not happy with the cherry on the cake. Uh, they prefer to have the whole cake. Um, and uh, uh, there, uh, to, to find, you know, the uh, the, the right way, and not uh, to give in to these uh, requests, and uh, not to give in to these uh, temptations. Uh, it it it, uh, it has and, and may have. Uh, this is a, a major challenge. And then uh, the other major uh, challenge uh, we have is, uh, again, because of uh, the relevance, uh, in particular of uh, the games, uh, which is bigger than ever uh, before and on, on, the, on the world stage, uh, because uh, we are at this moment in time, uh, the only event uh, in the world uh, that manages uh, uh, to unify, not virtually, but really the entire world in a, in a peaceful uh, uh, competition. And uh, uh, it's uh, the, the most uh, watched event, uh, maybe on par with a with the FIFA World Cup, or maybe a little bit higher. This depends on the, uh, on the statistics uh, you you apply. There you can argue for both, or all three. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, having uh, an event uh, which uh, there in Tokyo will be followed by far more than half of the world's population. Uh, that. Uh, this is uh, then uh, also, uh, and there I must say again, but uh, now in a much more sophisticated way, if I may say, a temptation uh, uh, 
for politicians uh, to uh, to use uh, the the games as a stage or misuse uh, the games as a stage for uh, uh, political uh, purposes and uh, also for uh, many uh, NGOs uh, for uh, any particular uh, interests uh, uh, were jumping uh, there on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on the games and uh, uh, are on the one hand expecting uh, from the games uh, to solve uh, their, their problems or are uh, threatening uh, the games uh, uh, for uh, political uh, or, uh, or, or, or other reasons. Mm. And uh, this again is uh, the other side of the coin of, uh, of uh, success. And uh, there uh, we have uh, to steer the games uh, uh, through uh, uh, these uh, uh, challenges, uh, which in, in, in some respect uh, remind us of uh, the hottest phases of the Cold War, uh, but uh, are today uh, 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 much more manifold because in, in the in the in the in the times of Cold War, uh, you know where the front line was, and uh, it was all very obvious. Uh, now uh, there are so many front lines, and uh, some nations uh, are eager to open up a new front line almost every day. Uh, that uh, there, uh, it is not as clear. The picture is not as clear anymore as it uh, as it used to be, and this makes it uh, much much more difficult. Mm. Thank you, Thomas conscious of time, I want to thank you very much for joining us this evening and we're going to move across to Pierre in a moment. Could I just ask you one last question? Uh, in well, these one... are always the most uh, <laughs> now have to, <laughs> in to one... be alert. <laughs> <laughs> in one sentence, looking back into the future, when well, that's, people... Uh, that's, uh, this Mike must have told you. Uh, <laughs> Not one that, sentence. Uh, to, to ask me a question. <laughs> To ask me a question which I have to answer in one sentence. One sentence, uh, yeah, is, uh, exactly. Okay, I'll, I'll do my best. One this sentence with a couple of commas, right? Yeah. Um, if people look back on your tenure as, as president in the future, what would you hope that they say about your legacy? What would you hope people this say? This I can answer in one question. This is not a fair question. Thank you very much uh, for the <laughs> evening. Uh, uh, I'm still working, so uh, let me, uh, let me uh, finish uh, my term as uh, president and then uh, uh, we can uh, meet uh, for a glass of wine and can uh, answer this philosophical uh, question, <laughs> which in the end uh, will anyway be answered by others and not, not uh, by, by myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, on behalf of the IMD Club of Lausanne and IMD, we have uh, a small gift for you. So uh, thank uh, you very has much. Has this passed uh, your compliance department? Uh, <laughs> or, uh, thank then, you uh, very much. Okay, books are acceptable. Books are acceptable. Thank you, merci. Thank you. And this is not a book, but uh, ah, can help you while you're reading the book. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, uh, okay, <laughs> this is uh, then for our conversation. Uh, it is indeed. About, uh, <laughs> thank you okay, very thank much. You, a real thank pleasure. you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, with that, if I could ask Pierre to join me on stage, wonderful, thank you. Please, thank you. You're mic'd up as well, so that's wonderful. So we can move this to over here. Wonderful. So, very welcome, Pierre. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. So, your title is Olympic Games Associate Director. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about? What you do? What's your responsibilities? Yeah, probably the title is not so uh, self-explanatory. Uh, First of all, good evening, everybody. Uh, tough act to follow the president, but uh, <laughs> I'll do my best. 
Uh, as uh, Olympic Games Associate Director, I'm basically in charge of the delivery of the Games, which means that day in, day out, we have a lot of relationship with the organizing committees, the International Federation, the NOCs, and uh, in the IOC, there is an Olympic Games Department, of which I'm the deputy of, and I really ensure that we work all together with the organizing committees to make sure we deliver according to standards, according to timeline, that we provide uh, advice, support, and work very closely with the uh, organizing committees because as you may know, obviously the IOC is franchising the games to an organizing committee and then we work with that local organizing committee to make sure they can uh, <laughs> deliver uh, the, the, the event in the most successful way but also deliver uh, a fantastic legacy. So that's more or less what we do uh, day in, day out. Yeah, wonderful. And, and which year was your first year of, of doing this role? I started in 2003. Yeah. Uh, my first role was actually uh, working on a program that the president talked about, which is the Athlete Career Program. Mm. So I was recruited to mm. establish this program uh, from the sport department, but I moved to the, the, the games department in 2010. So okay. I've been working on, on that role uh, let's say now, uh, almost 10 years. And so what's the biggest difference you see between the 2012 Games, for example, in London and the upcoming ones in Tokyo? What, what's changed most? I guess what has changed the most is really the, the way we deliver the event. Uh, I think Olympic Agenda 2020 had a number of recommendations, but most importantly, it has changed the philosophy that we have when working with an organizing committee. And Tokyo was already ongoing when we changed and it probably becomes more challenging to, uh, to establish complete new governance model. But nevertheless, I think the IOC today is a much more flexible partner where we used before to have very extensive contracts with a lot of details. Today we go with a, a much simpler version of that contract and also a much more welcoming attitude to, I would say, local context in mm. that the way we deliver games in Japan cannot be the same as we are doing in other cities and we need to factor in really their way of doing things. So as long as we more or less land on what we feel is the right level, how this is being done, we're really trying to give as much room as possible to the organizing committees, to its partner, to be creative. Uh, in many of the um, communications we do around the new norm, we're really talking about before the city adapting to the games, now it's really the games adapting to the city. Even if the end product is different, and actually we want it to be different. We really want to try and create something unique that works in that context. Everybody needs to understand why are we delivering the Paris game? What's the end uh, objective we have when we're doing these games? Why is it delivered that way? And that to us, is the fundamental uh, question from the first second when a city approaches us to talk about candidature, that's what we want to talk about. Mm. Why are you coming to us? What's the idea behind your project? And then we can look at how we put the project together. Mm. Yeah, and, and the um, Agenda 2020 was a major change initiative at the time, right? Did you face much resistance? Uh, I think when you worked a certain way for a very long period of time, uh, it does bring resistance, uh, even from within the IOC, because uh, the, the way that we have been working, the way that the whole industry, which supports and collaborates with the IOC, has been working, suddenly was changing. The uh, president talked about turning the page, which is uh, true, because uh, many of the reference documents we were using, many of the expertise that people had built, suddenly went down the drain somehow. So you're taking away from a number of people what they know. Mm -hmm. And they have to recreate for themselves new approach. So it's not so easy for an entire ecosystem to suddenly adapt new ways of uh, working, of being sufficiently flexible to hear that other people in the system may know better what to do than yourself. Mm -hmm. So I would say the, the biggest change probably has been the cultural change. There's lots of other changes but we are still very much going through a, a, a cultural uh, change at the okay. moment. Mm -hmm. For the IOC, for the stakeholders, probably easier for the organizing committee because mm -hmm. they, be, they get created out of 
uh, thin air, if we can put it this way. They, they start from scratch. And if the guidelines from the beginning are new ones, for them it's very easy to move forward with that philosophy on. Mm -hmm. And after the, the games, they, they dissolve. Right. So uh, for them, they, in that time, it's probably easier than for the system which has been in place for uh, some people for, for, for decades. Right, so six, seven years on, there's still challenges to change the culture. Yes, yes, yeah. and uh, part of the flexibility that I mentioned before is, for example, that we used to be very firm about a seven-year life cycle. Okay. So election, seven years out, and that's exactly how it was supposed to be. But today, our candidature process is very much of a nature where any city that wants to engage with the IOC can come and discuss to try and project themselves into the games 2030, 32, 34. We are talking to cities which have views, long-term development views, to be an Olympic city uh, you know, towards the end of the 2030s, for example. But it needs to start for some times uh, that early for this mm -hmm. to become a reality. And if we decide that the time is right for a city or several cities to be in an official uh, candidature process, then we can trigger this process at any time. So we, for example, uh, uh, allocated the games for Paris and LA uh, three years ago, uh, which is seven years in advance for right. Paris, but 11 for Los Angeles. And that changes completely the way you deliver your product. That was a big shift, product. right? Of yes. course, because suddenly yes. you add four years of lead time <laughs> to a project and you're just wondering, okay, well, what are we gonna be doing during these four years? And the reality is often not too much because the cost of these four years can be tremendous if you build up an organizing committee too quickly. Okay. So we are learning as we go to try and really make sure we focus on what is key at the mm. very beginning, which is building a brand, selling that brand, and putting some of the basis that you will need the day you become really active, but not become active too early, because otherwise the costs of delivery will be far more significant. Yeah, well, wonderful. Thank you. Questions, please. Yes, thank you. <coughs> Hi Pierre, thanks for being here. Um, uh, you both had a question about youth and had a question about sustainability, so I'm sorry you will get the question about credibility. <laughs> so what has changed uh, specifically on the governance and the process that you have in place to ensure, uh, you know, I work on ethics and compliance, so to ensure uh, this credibility to reduce risk of bribery and corruption, to reduce risk of attempts to human rights for the workers that they are building um, these uh, Olympic cities. So in general, how, what has changed to Agenda 2020 on that? Okay, so I'll, I'll take it from two angles. The first one is, first of all, the requirements. Because the IOC, when you are going through a candidature process, this is where you have a bit of leverage somehow you can discuss and require cities, regions, because it's also possible for regions today to put forward the, an Olympic bid. Uh, that's where you can discuss of some of the, the things you expect them to agree to. And today, the new contracts we are pushing forward, they are much more uh, ambitious when it comes to human rights, when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to ethics. So there are things that when you sign what we call the whole city contract, you have to accept upfront. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, everything is going to happen exactly like that because, as I mentioned before, every country has a different uh, reality, but we certainly spend a lot of time accompanying that organizing committee, that region, that country, to try and achieve exactly what we have as goals in that area. So if you read our contract, uh, which are available on our website, and you look at the contract for the 2028 games or the 2026 games, which is the most recent one, you will look at the language from human rights uh, in general or workers' rights or uh, that kind of uh, area is much more ambitious. So that's really a stronger base for, uh, for us to work with the organizing committee. Then it's really the second part is how we're working with the organizing committees. As I mentioned before, I would say uh, for a number of years, the IOC was more giving the rules and visiting from time to time and saying, oh, you didn't do this so well. Uh, please improve that for the next time I come. Today, we are very much at the table. We talk about co-construction and we really look at being shoulder to shoulder with the organizing committee 
trying to identify the issues that they have and solving them alongside uh, their partners. So the governance has changed very much. We spend much more time in the host city. In my unit, there are dedicated teams per edition of the games that spends considerable amount of time trying to understand the logic on site. And the whole organization really is much closer to the action. It's also why the IOC as an organization has grown when it comes to our capacity to support an organizing committee. We want to make their task simpler. Uh, just to be credible as a franchiser, we need to have more tools, more support, more energy to put at, um, at their disposal. So we're really working at that level. Uh, we've established forums at the higher level. So we're talking about mayors of host city, minister of sports, uh, National Olympic Committee president, where the IOC is sitting at the table. And we've established that for the first time in Paris. Every time we go there, we have what we call a joint steering forum where we can really influence on the bigger issues, where you can really have a say in discussions that uh, will have massive impact on the project, but they're not only how big is this venue going to be. There can be discussions of credibility, projects, strikes, political changes. We try to really make sure that uh, we are creating the conditions and we are a partner in those uh, in those discussions. So I would say it's both a mix of uh, improving our guidelines, being more ambitious, and then really being at the table alongside the organizing committee. Thank you. <coughs> here, then here, then here. So we go three. Yeah. No, please first. Yeah. Very brief question. Do you, uh, the president made an allusion to the somewhat competition between FIFA and IOC. Do you see and meet your colleagues of FIFA and you talk about how to organize games, events, uh, kind of a working level? And is there any kind of mechanisms? We had it in Brazil, no? Olympic Games and Football World Championships, and there was a public debate around whether it makes sense to have two big events subsequently in, in one country. Is there some kind of coordination mechanism with these other big type of sports events? Yes, there absolutely is. We see that very much as an opportunity. So obviously we don't choose the calendar of the football tournaments of our other mega events. We just had the Rugby World Cup delivered in Japan one year out of the games. We'll have that again in Paris. They have the 2023 World Cup of Rugby and we're going to be in 2024. Uh, we're going to have the situation in the US again where they have the World Cup 26, or at least they are one of the country organizing and we are 28. So it's something that we see as an opportunity, definitely. Uh, we're working with the federations in general, but obviously those that have events of that size are people which are very interesting to us because we talk about the same numbers, we talk about the same kind of complexity, and there's a lot we can learn from one another. So we organize regularly um, forums for us to discuss of specific topic, be it sustainability or very much more practical tasks like the master schedule is basically our tool to track the progress of an organizing committee. We met uh, a few weeks ago with FIFA and UEFA and World Rugby to try and look at the tools they are using and see if in the business, in the marketplace, we can together find better options. So we very much work uh, alongside uh, uh, event organizer of also, multi-sport event, you'll talk about Commonwealth Games, mm. European Games. I mean, we really try to consider all developments to make sure we don't miss out on, uh, on something out there. If you look at those events, the multi-sport one, they have a lot of their basic rules which are taken from us. So they really have applied a lot of the rules and parameters we've developed, but now that we are changing, we're also working with them to try and make sure everybody is heading towards uh, more simplification. And we also talk to organizers which have a um, single sport event. Recently, we spent some time with the NFL because on some fronts, they are very advanced in the way that they are working. And we really want to make sure that we are able to share what we know and that they can share with us. So very much an opportunity as we see it. Very good. Thank you. Please. Good evening, Pierre. It's good to see you, Navdi. <laughs> good to see um, you. Uh, I have a question regarding Youth Olympic Games. 
Yes. And I'm asking, uh, it's a tricky question, I'm curious to hear your opinion. I'm asking as a three times Olympian because I believe that, um, I mean, for me personally, Olympic brand was always very special. It's something holy, you know, those rings. And I have a feeling that we are diluting a little bit this brand with uh, multiple Olympic Games. We have a number of youth Olympic Games. We have winter, we have summer, we have European, we have cr um, a, a lot of Olympic Games. Uh, and uh, obviously we had a recent example of the uh, Oli Youth Olympic Games in Lausanne, and I think they were organized in a very professional way. It was well done. But my concern is that uh, we are talking about kids, you know, they are between whatever, 14, 18, <coughs> and we are putting so much pressure by, by putting around all this professional organization, you know, they're competing for medals, NOC competing who won more, uh, most, you know, that. Uh, top partners are activating, it's becoming commercial again, and we are lo we're losing this authenticity of the Olympic uh, rings. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious to hear whether it worked from your opinion, whether it uh, right format to organize. I'm definitely a big fan of having a, a kind of a youth competition festival and maybe in a different format. Does it need to have a name Olympic? Uh, so what's your opinion on that? And uh, after already, s what, how many or four editions here of the Youth Olympic winter and summer? So how does it work? Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a very topical question, having had the <laughs> event here. Uh, I would say there's probably two phases in the Youth Olympic Games. The, the, the first two summer editions were Singapore and Nanjing. And they were, honestly, of quite a large size, very ambitious, a lot of people will call them mini games, which obviously we don't like, but in terms of scope, that's really what it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, there has been a lot of reflections regarding the positioning of the Youth Olympic Games, and I think we really reached the turning point in the Buenos Aires uh, Games in 2018, where we really managed to have games delivered uh, in a much simpler way, but much closer to population with a lot of events which were free access, like was the case in, uh, in Lausanne, and trying to build uh, the opportunity for the athletes to not only compete, and, uh, but also get an experience, an education experience, a sharing experience. So for us, we really want to use the Youth Olympic Games as an opportunity for compete, yes, but also discover, share, learn something for the athletes. They are tons of programs around the event which really make this as much of an elite athlete competition but also a, an educational uh, experience. So I don't feel like you commented this is a very commercialized event. At this point in time, extremely difficult for us to, to get, I would say, support, be it locally through the organizing committees or through the IOC for a lot of investment for the Youth Olympic Games. This is, this is very much a project that the IOC is carrying itself, investing a lot of money in it, because we feel that there is an opportunity here to lead the way when it comes to trying to connect sport, culture, education. The president was explaining before how critical that is that sport is perceived as a tool for education. So very much we see the event as a, as a platform to promote that message. Uh, we see it also as an opportunity and that's true from my perspective because I'm not specialized in the Youth Olympic Games, but uh, it's really an opportunity to test concepts, mm. test sports. Uh, mm. The first time we had mixed event was in Singapore, and we can see today in the 2020 program that there's tons of mixed event uh, across all sports. Uh, in the way the event is being delivered, uh, the urban dynamic that the president was talking about is pretty much born in the Youth Olympic Games. And you will see in Tokyo this summer what we call the waterfront city, which is basically a giant urban park where a lot of activities will take place. So it's an opportunity for us also to see uh, how we can do things simpler, more affordable for people to come and have an Olympic experience. Because we see today in Japan, for example, that uh, the first wave of ticketing basically uh, uh, could have answered 10 times more people than actually received the ticket. So for us, it's important not to only create frustrations, and we are looking at all ways we have to give an Olympic experience to the larger number of people possible. 
come and uh, experience to see the athletes warming up. They are warming up anyway. Let's put the warm-up place in an area where you can come and watch at no cost. You just come and get the opportunity to see them warm up. So we're looking into those concepts. And from my perspective, the Youth Olympic Games also provides uh, that opportunity. But first and foremost, I would say it's really a platform to try and reconnect sport, education, and also lead the way globally in terms of, uh, of youth event and, and connect them. Thank you. Please. Yes. So here we go. Yep. Wonderful. So here, and then we go to the back. Thank you very much for your participation. Um, my question regards, um, uh, since we are in a business school, I'd like to talk also to hear you talking about business, you know, the business of uh, Olympic Games. Uh, you know, in the uh, Esprit Olympique, uh, Pierre de Courbert <coughs> provided uh, athletes from uh, being um, professionals. And uh, 90 years ago, Jules Ladoumec was sacked because he, he became professional and he could not attend the Olympic Games. So how do you resist now to uh, this pressure from the brands? Uh, to uh, to enter you know, into the, uh, uh, the the sphere of the athletes, and on the other hand, also how the isn't it an issue for the athletes not to be and uh, I mean to miss this source of funding, and then it becomes a sort of a elite sport in the way that they need to be um, uh, non-professional athletes. You see my yeah. So if I understand your question uh, fully, I mean I think the president answered part of it before in explaining that the games are really the main source of funding for the entire Olympic movement, meaning that a lot of the money we are generating through the Games is going into the clubs, the local federations, and is funding opportunities for non-elite athletes to, um, to participate. Now, if we look at the elite athletes during the Games, obviously one thing which is very particular to the Games, and I'm sure you, you, you are aware of this, there is no prize money in the Games. So they are coming solely to try and get uh, uh, a medal. And that's uh, a very particular thing in the games. There are discussions, and you would have seen that in the press recently, regarding the opportunities for the athlete, not so much to earn prize money, because I think uh, it is understood what you can have as an Olympic medalist after the games if you are one of them, but it's more what is the opportunity for the elite athletes to promote themselves during the games, be it on social media, because it's obviously uh, a rights holder for the game, so we need to kind of control uh, how they are able to, uh, to protect their rights. So the athletes who would like to do uh, you know, their own production and so on, there are basic rules. There's also rules regarding how they can promote their own sponsors. Obviously, if you're an athlete from uh, Switzerland and you come, there are sponsors of the Swiss team, so there are discussions between the athlete, its NOC, and then in the context of the games, because we want clean field of play, so you will never see uh, a sponsor inside an Olympic arena. We, we are not allowing uh, activation inside the venue, and the same goes for the athletes. So we are watching that quite closely, but we are being more flexible over the last couple of years when it comes to their ability to promote their sponsors in general. So if you're an athlete today, before, you couldn't really have any uh, promotion messages of your own sponsors during the games. Now you can within certain rules. So it's about finding the right balance for the athletes to get opportunities to be attractive to their own sponsors still during the games and trying to have a better share of uh, the, the value and the exposure generated by the games. Hmm. We had a question back here and then we come here. here so, sorry. Hi, Pierre. Uh, pr problem of terrorism. Sorry, we'll go, okay, we'll go here first and then we'll go back to you. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Terrorism. Terrorism. What so the, the question um, related to terrorism? The, how uh, do you tackle the problem of terrorism? Okay, so how do you tackle I mean, in, in today's world, obviously for us, it's a, it's a permanent concern. Uh, what we have at the IOC is uh, um, a set of requirements imposed on cities uh, and regions that uh, the environment has to be safe. 
So it is then upon the local authorities, the local government, the national government to create the conditions for the games to be safe. We don't instruct an, a city, a region, a country, this is what you have to do. Uh, they are very much, let's say, free to implement what they feel is the right uh, type of protection. Uh, we don't have that kind of expertise and uh, we certainly hear what they are doing and they inform us to make sure we can create also on our side the conditions for their program to work. But otherwise we leave that with the, uh, uh, the organizing uh, committee and the local uh, authorities. But we are very much still aware of what can happen in the context of the games. So we certainly watch in how it's being delivered that this is properly being addressed. Terrorism is obviously the one of the worst scenarios, but if we look at the games in Rio, we probably had more concern regarding petty crimes and uh, issues that you can have in a city of that nature with athletes that walk around without having the right kind of information or uh, accompaniment. So yeah, it, it, it's a huge concern for us, but we certainly leave most of that in the hands of the most capable uh, authorities to, to do the job. Thank you. Please, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, the, for coming here. Um, the president mentioned about the uh, <coughs> new norms and the, the agenda 2020 in regards to reduction of costs of constructions and also the COG budget. Um, could you mention a little bit more in terms of what was the impact of those two norms regarding reduction of costs of the games? Yes, well, thank you for that. That's an interesting question because <clears throat> it has been occupying us quite a lot uh, since the president was elected. So for us, as he mentioned, the first games where we could truly um, uh, have an impact of significance is Tokyo. The agenda came after Tokyo was elected, but it really allowed us to say, okay, this is their plan, and I'm talking here for now on the venue master plan. This is their plan as per their election. Let's use all the flexibility given by agenda 2020 and let's develop a new plan. And we worked with Tokyo and the Japanese authorities for six months on this plan, and we saved $2.2 billion in, uh, in uh, infrastructures. By deciding that it was okay to travel maybe uh, 45 more minutes uh, to reach that venue, which was not considered by them, rather than building a new venue or a temporary venue. We decided to reuse a lot of the 1964 venues, mm. which in many respects, the Japanese, under the old rule, felt we're not attractive enough to be a strong candidate for the games, but in reality, are a fantastic opportunity. They are very historical places. Japanese people love them. It's an opportunity to renovate partially some part of the venues. Suddenly, the cost of doing that was becoming a tiny portion of building a new venue. So we started to explore all those uh, opportunities and if we look at the context of Tokyo, in hard infrastructures, this is what we saved. We also saved because it's not only about brick and mortar, it's also about levels of service, reducing requirements, and after the first uh, review of the master plan, we saved another two billion. So all in all, today, the number we're communicating, but it's probably still underestimating what, uh, what is this investment, was 4.3 billion in, in Tokyo. Now Tokyo is a very particular environment. I'm sure most of you had the opportunity to do some business in Japan and uh, they will be the most successful organizing committee when it comes to commercial program, but they will also be the most expensive organizing committee when it comes to delivery of the operational budget. So these numbers are very big, but they reflect that we are able to really cut a significant portion of the costs through this program. Uh, we're applying it in, in Beijing. For example, also something which is interesting as part of the uh, Agenda 2020 is we are taking more responsibilities on some of the core aspects because it doesn't really make sense to have an organizing committee redeveloping every time their own answer to the same issue. So historically, since 2008, uh, we've taken over the broadcast production. So this is uh, delivered by a company owned by the IOC. But from Beijing onwards, we will deliver the ticketing uh, tool, 
and a number of other things which we really felt there would be added value for the IOC to, to invest in and to basically provide to the organizing committees. Uh, in Paris, we're developing a very different model to roll out uh, the games. Um, until now, a lot of the capacities to deliver the games was built inside the famous organizing committee, which can, uh, games time, represent close to 6,000 people, plus a number of volunteers, which can vary, but a very large entity. Today, we want the organizing committee to stay as small as possible and to outsource their capacities to the most knowledgeable entities in the country. So I'll give you an example. Uh, it wouldn't make any sense for Paris to build a tennis unit inside the organizing committee. They have Roland Garros. They are delivering every year one of the arguably lead events in the country. They will negotiate a contract with Roland Garros to deliver that event. Because the way that uh, we've been analyzing through the new norm is that individual championship cost compared to the cost of that sport in the games, the multiplying effect is extremely large. In the summer, it's seven times more expensive to deliver the same sport individually as a world championship or in the context of the games. So we're trying as much as possible to create pockets of delivery to avoid, I would say, the um, mass effect of, uh, of delivering an event of, of, of that side. And that's why in Paris, we will be doing that. We will also be uh, taking over more responsibility on, uh, on some fronts. Um, other concrete examples, we have reduced considerably the size of accredited seating. I'm not sure if you've been to an Olympic game, but basically in the games, there, are, there is stands reserved for accredited people, but they are free to come and go as they please. But it means maybe in the preliminary of uh, table tennis in the morning, I have nothing about, against table <laughs> tennis, but just an example, very early in the morning, preliminary of table tennis, maybe you would not have a lot of accredited people. And over the last four editions of the games, we've documented every seat. How is it being used? And every time we have a very strong trend that shows that maybe for this type of event, uh, it's 20% field in general, we are making a call that we're giving back those seats for the organizing committee to sell. And in uh, Tokyo, we have given back more than 100,000 seats to the organizing committee. So we are doing a lot of data capture to try and make sure not only do we know what was delivered by the organizing committee or what was planned by the organizing committee, but most importantly, we know what was used. And that, when it comes to transfer of knowledge, is gold. Because right now, we are able to say, OK, we used less than 50% of the capacity of the buses for this particular client. Next time around, less buses or smaller buses. So we learn as we go, and this is really critical to, uh, to what we do. So I would say in terms of numbers, I'm not able to give you more than what we have for Tokyo because we're close enough to get a sense of what it represents. But the impact is, is gigantic because, as I mentioned also before, the key is really the attitude of the IOC. If an organizing committee comes tomorrow to us and says, ah, oh, I'm not sure I want to do it this way. How about I do it this way? And before it would have been, well, how about you do it this way? <laughs> and now it's really, OK, let's sit down and see if we, if we can get there the way you want. And we'll try to add value to, uh, to the reflection. So this, to me, is really how you can create optimal savings, because you use people's understanding already existing ways of working rather than developing new ones. Right. OK. No, wonderful. Thank you. Please. Um, while you're passing that, I'm going to ask a, a question that came in from one of our alumni, Chris Preston, who's watching the live stream. And it links to something that Thomas touched on. But he asked, how do you think eSports will develop? Will they complement or cannibalize the physical experience? And how will the IRC respond to the development? Yeah, I think it's a very vast topic. Today, the IOC uh, is spending more and more time about understanding e-sport. So you may have read about the president taking some position in this respect. Uh, for now, really, the, the position is that we are trying to build a relationship with the e-sport industry to make sure we understand how it works, that uh, there is information being shared, we have one person in the IOC whose job it is to try and uh, 
document, understand, speak. So we really want to be aware of what's going on. We have commercial partners, which obviously would die for eSport to be getting, a, I would say, a place in the Olympic program. But this is clearly not for any time soon. Mm -hmm. I think the president keeps commenting that eSport for him clearly relates to sports. So he talked about uh, those sports today, which have a virtual uh, side to it. So like the virtual regattas you can have in sailing, or a lot of people to do, today doing biking uh, in mm -hmm. a virtual mm -hmm. way through the, the softwares we know. So this whole dimension is of a high interest for us, because it does bring, for some of them, opportunities to do sport, and for others, just to bring more people to be interested in, uh, in sport. But uh, today, this industry is very much commercially owned, which is very different to the uh, Olympic model. So it's really, I would say, exchange of information, but yet no plan to integrate those uh, e-sport those e inside our, uh, our program. But in Pyeongchang, we had an e-sport competition happening before the games. We will have the same in, uh, in Tokyo. So this is done collaboration with some of our uh, marketing partners, which are, as I mentioned, very eager to, uh, to elaborate more on that, uh, on that opportunity. So I would say it's a constructive dialogue, a smart one now, because mm -hmm. I think everybody sees that uh, it can bring value to, to speak together. But it is a very, I would say, uh, far-reaching process that will take time to, uh, to build up. So I hope I answered Chris's okay. question. Thank you. Please. Hi. Um, you already touched base a little bit, but I was just curious to know if you could share, when you look in the uh, candidature of these places, regional cities, how much you consider the post-impact on the sustainability? Because uh, you mentioned some structure, infrastructure, so on. But how much is the post-impact? I mean, what's going to happen with this infrastructure? How are we going to use? Yeah. So to us, this is the first question is, Today, we are very clear. If there is no legacy for a venue or an infrastructure, it should not be built. Meaning, whether it has to be temporary or you have to go beyond the limits of the cities, the limit of the region, or the limit of the country. So the Olympic Agenda 2020 opened that opportunity for any project to come and basically rely on venues which could be outside the country. And for the 2026 bid, we had, for example, Sweden, which do not have, at this point in time, a sliding center that was going to go to uh, the Baltic states to have the competition there. Rather than building a sliding center, because we know those are venues with extremely challenging legacies, they were already proposing that they would go in, uh, in another country. So for us, this is really the starting point of any bid is, OK, this is what you have. You want to add those venues. What is the legacy plan? What is the business plan? Because you, everybody can say there will be a legacy plan. And I'll give you the example of, uh, of Pyeongchang. We were right in the middle as well, uh, because they were started much before we validated the new norm. But they wanted to build the sliding center. When we established the new dynamic, we said, we don't believe in your uh, business plan. And um, there were long discussions, painful ones. They ended up wanting to build it, because obviously there's always a pressure from the commercial, the political level, to try and uh, you know, raise the profile of a city through building uh, something like this, create employment, business opportunities. But the reality is today, what we had predicted is the reality. It is very challenging to get this venue to be uh, having, a, let's say, a positive turnover. It's not used that much. So it clearly is a venue that we will struggle to profile in the most positive way moving forward. And the, it's the, definitely not the interest of the IOC that there are venues out there which have been built for the games and have zero use. So we spend now a lot of time trying to make sure that the proposed use after the games is viable you would have heard a ton of things about Sochi because of the cost of the development of the infrastructure. But anyone going to Sochi today will be blown away by how they are using the resort. Sochi Resort, Rosa Couture, where they build 
the, uh, the let's say the, 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 the skiing domain is 84% uh, filling uh, every year, which is much more <laughs> than what we have here. So they had an ambition to build for themselves a resort, snow resort, which they don't have in Russia anywhere else, and they delivered on that. So they are very happy with what they have, and it's proving to be a very big success. But yes, the investment was considerable. But if you look at the investment we had in many of the European countries over a much longer period of time, it's probably not too, uh, too dissimilar. So there is always a price to an end. Obviously today, uh, to be honest, we will always try to see that uh, you know, we don't push a country over uh, something which is not credible. We had discussion with some countries for 2026 which really wanted to come with project for the Winter Games that were starting from scratch. Mm. And as much as we can see the potential for winter sport in Russia, in those countries, it's more uh, complicated to, uh, to project. So we did have the discussion with them, said, sorry, we don't believe today you are mature enough to carry a project of that uh, magnitude. And for us, that discussion is central. If you cannot explain why, I don't think you should be uh, uh, doing a project all the way to, uh, to the end because all the way through every week you're going to get the question uh, about this and we certainly don't want to be uh, in a mode where everybody is just wondering but why are we doing that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, one final question for you. This is your job, this is your life. Yes. You go to the games. Can you relax and enjoy them when you're there? <laughs> or are you constantly kind of watching the logistics and what's happening? No, yeah, definitely not. Uh, as much as I uh, you know, encourage everyone to come, I definitely don't encourage you to come in my capacity <laughs> because uh, being in charge of operations during that period, there is very little, uh, very little time to, uh, to enjoy. When you ask the president before, you know, what, uh, I mean, like his most memorable moments, and I was yeah. thinking, oh, she asks me the same, what am I going to say? <laughs> and I think it's probably a mix between my very first games in 2004, where I had a, a very constrained role, where I think I discovered the Olympic environment, and I was blown away by what it means and the opportunities it creates, but I didn't have that much work because it depends also on the work you have. It was very targeted. I was working, you know, like nine to six, and uh, I had time to go through things. But I, I would think my other preferred moments probably the end of the Rio Games, okay. because Rio, as you uh, may remember, was a huge challenge for us to deliver in a context which was very complicated, and there was very few people that believed uh, it could happen, and it did. But I must say, the time it actually finished, I felt <laughs> extremely relieved <laughs> that uh, we actually had pulled this through because it was really, uh, you know, the, the political, the financial circumstances were yeah. as complex as could be. So to be able to still do that, uh, that definitely will remember some, will remain with me as a, a big achievement, but also a very good memory when I saw the the light uh, being extinguished uh, in the cold. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have a, a gift as well oh. for you. Thank yes. you very much, Pierre. Thank you very much. I, I love these exchanges and discussions. So we have a little present for you. Thank I think you. one is from Susan. Yep. So Wonderful. I'll give you the Thank privilege you. to. Thank you very much. Great Thank pleasure. you. And, and this is from the, the club. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I love the Olympic Games. I love the spirit. I love the values. And I'm really confident about the work you're doing that will be beneficial for the people and the society. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. Of course. Thank you as well to Suzanne for uh, animating and uh, entertaining this evening. I was great. I really like it. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Thank you very so, much. Anyway, thank you. And, and if, I could, uh, if I could say a huge thank you to Jean Daniel and to Sergey, where's uh, Sergey? So, as well. For the work they've put in to make this event a reality has been huge. And, and they do IMD in honor with the work they do with the uh, IMD. Lausanne Alumni Club. So huge round of applause. Thank you.
So before we, we move on for the, the drinks, um, I would just like to announce the next uh, event. One will be next week and after work uh, in Eat Me in Lausanne. And on March 18th, we will, have, uh, we will welcome Sil Kepan, uh, a former acrobat uh, and the company uh, TWICE to talk about technology to the service of humans. And I have to say we have the pleasure to have uh, Silke with us tonight. She's uh, currently training hard for the Paralympics in, uh, in, uh, in Tokyo this summer. And uh, she's coming tonight just to uh, participate to the event. But I'm looking very much forward to see you on the 18th of March here on, uh, on stage. Thank you. On April 2nd, there will be a panel about uh, uh, social networks and how to build a global brands with uh, social networks that will take place on the 2nd of April here at IMD. So I think we all want to go for a little drink and some, uh, some food, so let's go. Thank you.